Watching this movie made me sad, but not for the reasons you might think. Honestly, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom is a fun time. It was exactly what I expected and I enjoyed myself. But the DCEU is over, being robbed and sabotaged of its potential before really truly getting to do what it could have as a cinematic universe. And that breaks this viewer's movie loving heart. But I guess it ends the only way it ever could, with a movie that's admittedly a blast but chopped to pieces from different regimes for an end product that feels like it's missing something, someone, or some footage. And in this case, all of the above. Spoilers from here on out. The film catches us up to speed on Arthur's life since the first film, and everything in between was some really shallow humor that didn't land. In fact, the only humor that tended to was with his brother Orm, Ocean Master. The whole buddy travel banter stuff was a highlight that I wish had been leaned into heavier. The film improves dramatically when he does show up and when he's on screen because Patrick Wilson is great. There's clever jokes, great set pieces, and I buy the dynamic between them and where it ends up at the end. If you have brothers as I do, it hits harder than expected and was a pleasant surprise in this regard. The world building continues to be fascinating, the ocean realm echoing high fantasy Lord of the Ring vibes on more than one occasion. Plus, there's a lot of kingdom traveling for a chance to see more of the undersea culture, and it's just cool. They lean into that more than I thought they would, and it's fun, vibrant, and beautiful. The effects are fairly consistent, although I will note the water VFX around the Atlantean characters, specifically the hair, kind of looks unfinished on the more human ones. It just looks off. It doesn't always look how it should, but considering this film was left to die, I'm not surprised. And we'll get into that later. There's some great, fun action sequences. James Wan is a fantastic director, so that's no surprise. There's memorable production design and even some great practical effects with creatures and creature design, which surprised me. And I love the creativity and the technology and how they choose to showcase some of that. Amber Heard isn't in it much, but she's used differently than I expected, but also as I expected. It's kind of hard to explain, but Mara is a good character, so I have conflicting feelings there, but we're just going to leave it at that. I also think one of the biggest weaknesses from the first film returns, which I love the first movie, is the iffy voiceover and all-around weak dialogue. Everything seems a little too corny sounding or even self-aware where playing it straight could have elevated the seriousness of many situations. There's a pretty big focus on Randall Park's Stephen Shen, who never quite finds his place in the movie and his motivations needed more fleshing out. But he plays it well and he plays it earnestly. Black Manta as a villain is as cool and intimidating as ever, but sadly kind of underutilized and all over the place. This movie kind of promised a revenge story for Manta, and it does, and we already had some of that in the first one, so I get needing a greater threat and wanting to make it different from what came before. I just don't really care for the whole possession angle. It sort of robs the tenacity of Black Manta, and the power-up with the trident that he finds was enough. The Dark King, or whatever he was called, was visually awesome, and I just wish they had found a better way to incorporate him, because it was super anticlimactic to the point that me and my friend looked at each other and said, yeah, that was really anticlimactic. It was a huge build-up and a big letdown. Ending the movie on the speech of revealing Atlantis to the world is way too similar to Black Panther's ending, but it still works. And honestly, it's a decently fitting, happy ending to the DCEU, seeing them come together to make a better world. And the fourth wall break from Momoa doing a final mic drop to end the film isn't subtle, but he's going out on his own terms, which I highly respect that. And that self-awareness made it sadder. <laughs> But speaking of that world event, where was the Justice League? This is the problem with cinematic universes. It's like these crazy world monumental disasters happen and the other heroes that the world's popular with don't show up. It's probably best not to ask these questions. Like they could have cut the money shot out of Zack Snyder's Justice League and put them in the background and recolored them or whatever at the conference somewhere in the film. Kind of, or have them in the background like The Flash did. And that would have gone a long way. Not to mention there was originally a Michael Keaton Batman cameo that was scrapped because the ending of The Flash changed. Then a highly publicized by Jason Momoa reveal that Ben Affleck would be back as Batman in this one more time. And that's gone too. That sucks, as it would put a neater bow on everything, or the universe, but I guess it could have teased something and they didn't want to overpromise anything that wasn't happening. But I hate that we have lost so many cameo scenes between this and The Flash with so many of these great actors. I wish they put them online or on a disc uh, for a home media release or something. And that's the thing that bothers me most. I know this movie was left to die. You don't announce a cinematic universe is going nowhere, that it no longer matters, in the midst of comic book movie burnout, plus doing minimal marketing, no red carpet premiere or party, and barely any attempt at recovery post Hollywood strikes with the marketing. It's very telling that they have continued to let the DCU die a slow, agonizing death. There's no telling how much brand damage was done, 
or how much shaved off this movie to get it to the standard two hour fare with no connective tissue, and it's obvious that there were reshoots, as it isn't the film's fault, but it's a classic case of the DCEU being sabotaged from within by different regimes all over again. The first Aquaman is the highest ever grossing DC film, so I don't understand the foolishness going on right now, and I cannot overstate how poorly this transition has been handled and that they are not capitalizing on the potential that this movie had. So all in all, Aquaman 2 has fun banter, it's a good brother story, great action, and a rich fantasy world to get lost in with mostly consistent visuals. We definitely won't get any more, which is sad. Moa has long touted that Lobos is his dream character, and that's fine, that's fine with me. You know, just let the DCEU be the DCEU. It doesn't need to bring anybody back. James Gunn's already skirting that line with some of his characters he wrote. Don't get me started. So there won't be an Aquaman trilogy, and that's that's sad. But what's sadder is this is a much more forgettable movie than it should have been and could have been with poor dialogue, iffy humor, and a general sense that there's something missing beyond just the extra footage. It's sadly, strangely fitting. The final DCEU film is one that was studioed to death. Thank you, DCEU, for 10 years of memories all over the place and the right potential, and honestly, some of my favorite superhero films and one of my favorite trilogies ever. And thank you for trying and delivering where you could, James Wan. It's a fun time and a solid final bow to the audience. Not everyone will agree there, but this is DC we're talking about. And deep down, we all know this is a very public execution of the franchise. To recontextualize a Superman quote from Batman v Superman, the DCU is dead, bury it. I give Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom 3.5 out of five stars. Thank you for taking the time to watch. Please hit like, consider subscribing, and remember, always look for the good.